<laughs> Good evening. Good to see you tonight. Uh, in case you were wondering, I just wanted to one last reminder before we get into summer and it begins to get hot. Chiefs won the Super Bowl. So this will probably be the last time I wear my jersey. I just decided to pull it out tonight for fun. And uh, uh, I, I walked across town to come to church tonight. I needed some exercise. And uh, I got here and I was hot. And I was like, yep, it's time for that thing to go into the closet until August when it comes preseason. And then I don't mind because it's football season. And I'll wear it and be hot. But that's a whole other story. So we'll get to that. Hey, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Um, welcome, welcome, those that are watching online, I'm glad you're watching, and uh, hi Julie, she said that she wasn't going to come tonight, uh, just getting back from Kentucky, and you know, they shut the hospital down with coronavirus and everything, so she's just kind of, you know, playing the safe thing, and she said, but I'll be watching, so hi Julie, we're glad you're watching tonight. Uh, wasn't Sunday incredible? Wow, wow, wow. If you weren't here, sorry Diane, you missed it, you missed it. You know, what I, you know what I long for and, and I pray for is, is this ex- expectation that rises up in the body of Christ to where we don't want to risk missing church because if it's as good or better than last time, it's going to be so good. And, and I'm not talking about a show. Don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about encountering the presence of God. And I'm telling you what, uh, somebody wrote a song about it, I think, said that's better than any drug I ever tried. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'd rather be in, in God's presence than anywhere else. So the ladies from Teen Challenge, they were with us. Precious ladies. My goodness, I sat over there and bawled through about half the service. And uh, as they were sharing their testimonies, uh, that skit that they did when the three of them were out front, uh, and, and they said, you know, this is what I was before and this is what I am now. Oh, my goodness, that was powerful. First, I was like, what are they doing? But, boys, they kept going. I was just like, come on now. And uh, so anyway, if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to watch the video on Facebook or YouTube, and uh, we will definitely have them back again in the future. And uh, I don't know, maybe next time we'll have a group of the guys come and and rotate back and forth. But thank you for loving on them. Uh, You bought a bunch of their stuff, their crafts and stuff out there in the foyer, excuse me, and uh, uh, loved on them, you know, while they were here. and, And I got a thank you card from them today, and they expressed their appreciation for how welcoming you were, and so thank you, thank you, thank you. All right? Uh, thank you. I, I just about said that again. Uh, tonight, we're going to continue in our mini-series, Promises of God. We're in part five this week, and so let me quickly remind you of the f- titles. I'm just going to give you the titles of the first four. We uh, uh, Promise number one was, I am forgiven. And right from the beginning, I understood that this was going to be a good series. Amen? Number two, I am free. Never going back to the old sinful lifestyle, to the old chains and bondage and slavery of sin. Jesus has set me free, so I am free indeed. Part three, I have hope. Glory. I am not hopeless, but I am full of hope because Christ lives in me, and I watch Him move and work and do such great things in my life and in your life that it gives me hope. Number four, this was a good one. I am gifted. God has given each and every one of us a special gift. Some of those are are manifested in spiritual gifts that we read about uh, last week. Then we also talked about how sometimes he gives us a unique gift that's, that's just us, maybe a gift of hospitality or just a gift to love on people, right? And uh, so whatever your gift is, first you've got to discover what the gift is and then use that gift with everything that you have to the honor and glory of God. Amen? So tonight we're going to talk about gift number or uh, uh, promise number five, and that is I have a purpose. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said, I wish I knew what my purpose was or I'm just trying to figure out what my purpose in life is, listen, we have a purpose and it's God-ordained. So we're going to uh, look at that here in just a little bit. So uh, this goes hand-in-hand with last week's study, so it's like frosting on the cake, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. So I want you to say it with me. I'm going to say it first, then you repeat after me. I am forgiven. 
I am free. I have hope. I am gifted. And I have a purpose. These are the promises of God. So let's see what this promise has. Uh, uh, this promise has. It's recorded in God's word. Let's prepare ourselves for a revelation from God of what the purpose in our life is, what our purpose on this planet is uh, tonight. If you haven't figured it out, maybe tonight's the night God will open your eyes and your heart to understand exactly what your purpose is here. Maybe you think you found your purpose and it's been wrong. God may correct your vision tonight, okay? So listen, we're doing this a little different tonight. I have four text passages Four passages of Scripture, four verses of Scripture from different parts of the New Testament that together will reveal to us the purpose of God in our lives. So let me share them with you, then we'll come back and we'll talk about each one of them for a few minutes. I'll wrap it all up with telling you what your purpose is in life. I'm going to give you the answer tonight. When I'm counseling people, uh, and I learned this from... Uh, Pastor Miller, when we were the superintendent, when we were in uh, Ash Grove with him, and uh, I was p- pastoring a second campus, and I'd come to him with a sixth situation. I'd say, Pastor, this is what's going on, and, and I just don't know what to do. And he would say, well, what do you think you're going to do? Well, I'm thinking I might do this or that. Okay, that might be good. Any other options? Well, maybe this or that. Yeah. What about this or what about that? You ever think about this? You ever think about that? I'm like, how am I supposed to know what to do? Pray, listen to the voice of God, make your decision, and I'll stand behind you 100%. And uh, so I don't usually give the answer. I, 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 for me, if I discover the answer on my own, I'm more likely to remember it and I'm more likely to receive it. But I'm going to give you the answer tonight and then let you uh, go home and, and uh, wrestle with it, okay? So... Uh, Read with me from God's Word. Let me get back to my first page here. I got them all uh, typed out here. You're going to need to find Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, Let me just do a little side note. All of the the first three verses or the first three three scriptures, I'm going to read to you a New American Standard Version. And then the last one, I got to go to NIV for the last one, okay? So most of them will be New American Standard. The last one will be NIV. Here's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. What's your purpose? What's your purpose? The second scripture is John chapter 15 and verse 16. John 15 and verse 16. It says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. What's your purpose? What is your purpose? The third scripture is Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. You like that one, huh? Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. What's your purpose? Finally, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. How can you talk about purpose and not go to Jeremiah? Anybody? 29? 11, for I know the plans for you, declares the Lord. The plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So tonight we're going to talk about each of these and uh, see how we can discover, if we can, yeah, see how we can discover our purpose. But let's pray first. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises of your word. And tonight, God, I pray that you will uh, help us as we look at each of these scriptures to discover fresh and anew the purpose for which we have been created, the purpose for which you breathe life into us. And Lord, then as we begin to discover that purpose, help us to embrace it with all that we are and to walk in the fullness of it so that it might bring, so we might bring honor and glory to you and to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. You are, we are his workmanship. It said, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead, ahead of time or beforehand so that we would walk in them. I looked up the word workmanship. It means the degree of skill with which a product is made or with a job is done. In this case, I think we're talking about the craftsmanship, the artistry, I think one translation, instead of using the word workmanship, uses the word handiwork. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis to see that God created us in his image. And then he declared that his creation was good. Now, that's, <laughs> that kind of made me chuckle. Could you imagine God creating mankind in his image and go, whoo, Boy, that's a mess. <laughs> right? <laughs> but he made us in his image, and he declared that it's good. Listen, there are some things that people are good at and some things that people simply are not good at. Hello? <laughs> My wife is good at drawing, okay? She draws portraits and landscapes and old barns, Listen, I can't draw stick people with a ruler. Right? Can I get a witness? Connie is a painter. This beautiful mural back here is one of Connie's masterpieces. And there are others that she has in her art studio that I've seen that are incredible. She does these amazing paintings, and she does them on some crazy objects too, like turtle shells and turkey feathers. And I'm like, who thinks to paint on a turkey feather? You know, But that's the gift that God has given her. Me, I don't have the patience to paint a wall, right? Well, the bulk of it, but the cutting in part, that's where I get a little sloppy because I don't have the patience to do it. I'll do it, but I can guarantee you there's going to be a little spot on the ceiling and on the trim and because I'm not going to take time to tape it off like you should, right? So that's just not my thing. I'm not into the details. The details in that type of a thing drive me crazy. Let's just do it and get it done. Some people can sing. Josh Groban. Do I need to say anything more? The man has the most phenomenal voice you can imagine. I believe that one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a voice like that. And in the meantime, I'm just going to pretend like I do. So when I try to hit those high notes and I squeak and squall and I go off key and get pitchy and all that other stuff... You just have to remember, I'm trying to be Josh. Because one of these days, I'm going to have a voice just like he does. I think you get the picture here. Listen, God himself, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he created each and every one of us according to his image. We are his handiwork. And listen, God is good at everything that he does. Nothing is done halfway in God's realm of doing things. His plans, his purpose, his production is perfect. Always. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Yes, God created mankind at the beginning, and yes, he declared that his creation was good, but listen, things got really good when we, were, when we are created in Christ Jesus. 
When Jesus comes in and the, the old vessel, the old dirty pot, the tattered rags, uh, uh, all of that is brought to him and he comes and he takes possession of it, he creates it better than ever before. How do you get better than perfection? Jesus can do it. It's in this uh, recreation that we find our purpose. In our recreation in Christ, we are called to do good works. We were created in Christ by the craftiness of God himself to do good. And those good works are on purpose and they are for a purpose. And that purpose is to bring honor and glory to God, the one who created us. And so do the good works for which you were created. Ladies and gentlemen, that is your purpose. Number two, John chapter 15 and verse 16. I like this. I like this a whole lot. I was the fat kid that never got chose, never got picked for the team. I was always the last one in PE class on the playground at whatever. You know, you're dividing up in teams, and the, the, the super cool guys and the jocks and the people that play basketball and all the, you know, all of those guys got picked first. And I was always the last dorky little short fat kid that wasn't very good at anything to get picked. But God. Woo, glory. My two of my favorite words, right? He chose me. And he chose you. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Let's get this straight. From the beginning of time, the plan of God has always uh, revealed that he chooses us first, not the other way around. Why? Because he created us with a purpose. He created us on purpose. And as I'm thinking about that, I was reminded about some scriptures that uh, uh, even as I, as I write, I begin to think about how uh, God chooses us and then uses us. How, how come he chose us first? Listen to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Even when we didn't want anything to do with God, he still was choosing us. He still was drawing us. He still was calling us because he had created us on purpose and for a purpose. Even before you and I decided to follow after Christ, God loved us. But because we were not committed to him, he made a way that we might be restored to him. He didn't make us choose him. Instead, he made a way for us to choose him. And in doing so, he had already chosen us. Jeremiah 31, 3. It says this, The Lord appeared to him from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving kindness. Ooh, glory. God's love for us has existed from everlasting to everlasting. It knows no beginning. It knows no end. So uh, God has called us and chosen us. Our love for him, in our love for him, we are weak. In our love for him, we have tendencies to be wishy-washy. We love God part-time, part-way but not him. He's all in. All in love with you and with me, and he is constantly choosing us and constantly drawing us to himself. God has chosen, listen, 
God has chosen you. He has chosen you even though he knows your imperfections, even though he knows your shortcomings, even though he knows your flaws. He's okay with it all. Loves you enough, he's not going to leave you there. But he loves you enough that just because you have those things, he's not going to reject you. He's going to draw you and he's going to call you. It makes me think of the antiquer. I don't know if that's a word or not. The antiquer. I put it in parentheses. You know that person that goes to Kirk and Connie and Margo and I, we like to go to auctions. We, Margo and I like to go to flea markets and garage sales. And you see that person at a garage sale or, or at a, more often at, at, a, at an auction, and they're bidding on this old ugly pot. And you're thinking, I wouldn't give a plug nickel for that thing. And they give $75 for it. Because the antiquer knows the value when nobody else can see it. And that's kind of how God is. To the average person, we see the old dish, the old cabinet, the old junk car, but to the trained eye, they see a treasure. God, listen, God sees a treasure in you. Nobody's ever said that I was a treasure. God has, and he's telling you right now. So accept it, receive it. From You can walk around with boldness and with confidence and with with joy in your heart because you can say, God, I'm a treasure to God. So he chose me even before... I wanted anything to do with him. They see the treasure. God sees the treasure that you are. He uh, he is the the, uh, expert on you. Think about that. I mean, he created you after all. And he created you in his image. He is the expert. He knows your purpose. He knows why you were created and he knows your value. And this isn't in my notes, but let me just throw it in here. And in case you're wondering what your value is, your value is the price of Jesus' life. That's how valuable you are to him. So why did God choose you? He chose you, he chose me to bear much fruit. God chose you and me, and he appointed us to go and bear much fruit for his kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our purpose. What do you mean, bear much fruit? Let me give you a picture here. Fruit reproduces the same fruit, right? Apples produce apples. Grapes produce more grapes. You, child of God, Christian, follower after Jesus Christ, you, we, should be producing more Christians, more followers of God, more children of God. In other words, part of our purpose is to lead others into that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then to help them grow in the knowledge and in the relationship that they now have with him. That is our purpose. Number three, Romans chapter 8 Verse 28, you are called to his purpose. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. We could focus on a few different aspects of this verse, but let me just look at the last portion of this. To those who are called according to his purpose. Child of God, you have been called to God's purpose. And anything and everything that you experience in this life, he is more than able to bring it around to accomplish his plan and his purpose. Now, the enemy of our soul will try his very best to keep us from getting uh, the hand of God uh, to be at work in our lives. But God is diligent and faithful and, and intent on working in us. God is working in every circumstance, 
and every situation to accomplish in and through us exactly what he wants to accomplish. And nothing can stop that except you. I had a phone call from a, a, a college professor today. I haven't even had, I forgot to tell you about this. Sorry, baby. Sometimes she learns things and when I get up here and start talking. And she's like, how come I never? Because I just forgot I'm old. I had a call today from a college professor asking me to come and address his class about life insurance. And I said, well, I'm not a licensed life insurance agent, so I probably wouldn't want to do that. But since you're at a Bible college, if you would ever be interested in having me come and talk about the uniqueness of ministry in a rural setting, I'd be thrilled to death to do that. You know? And uh, so, you know, it's just like, what in, in, in the world is going on here? We are called. God orchestrates our lives to such a degree that everything that comes across our path, every opportunity, every circumstance, every trial, every difficulty, everything, he has the, uh, the unique ability to turn that thing to his honor and to his glory and make something spectacular out of it. Listen, I never wanted to be an insurance agent. That was not like when I was a kid growing up, I thinking, I want to wear khakis and a red you know, shirt and say, State Farm, would you really do that for me? You know, Jake, no. I didn't have dreams about that. I didn't have dreams about being a preacher neither, but that's another story. God takes circumstances, situations, and works them around to bring honor and glory to his name. We often get in the way of what God is trying to do to accomplish. What? Let me back up. We often get in the way of what God is trying to accomplish in our lives. The way we do that is through pride. Sometimes it's arrogance or fear. You're not going to like this one. Or ignorance. But whatever it is, God wants to take that and use it to fulfill his purpose in and through you. You have been called to his purpose. Chosen for his purpose. So walk in and live in his purpose. Listen, that, that's where, oh, this goes right along with what God shared with me in the middle of that song. This goes right, listen to what I'm about to say. Walking in and living in God's purpose, that's where the blessings and the favor and the peace of God is found. Is when we're smack dab in his purpose perfect will and purpose for our lives. It doesn't mean it's always going to be easy, but there will be this contentment and this peace that overcomes us when we are in God's perfect place for us and nothing else compares. Hallelujah. Number four, last one, Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Listen, God knows. God knows. It's not something he's trying to figure out or even work out. He knows the plan and the purpose that he created, for, created you for. And it's a good plan. It's a plan to prosper you not to harm you. Some translations say it like this. Plans for peace and well-being, not for disaster. Plans to give you a future and a hope. The Amplified Classic Version says it's plans for welfare and peace, not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. I like that. Listen to this one. This is the uh, uh, complete Jewish Bible says God's plans for us, they're plans for well-being, not for bad things, so that you can have hope and a future. Finally, the message. The message says this and re- for the translation or the, the paraphrase of Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, I'll show up and take care of you as I promised, and I'll bring you home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to care for you, not to abandon you. 
plans to give you the future you hoped for. Who? I'm liking that. He's going to come for us. He's got it all worked out, and he's going to give us the, the future we've all hoped for. My, that's good. God was speaking to the Israelites in this passage regarding them being uh, coming out of captivity, but I believe the same plan and the same purpose that God had for them, he has for you and he has for me. And if we will let him, he will show up in our lives and he will take care of us just like he promised that he would. And he will bring us back to a place of restoration because he knows what he's doing. It's part of his plan. Listen, the fall of man did not catch God off guard. <laughs> Nothing that has ever transpired in the realm of mankind has ever caught God off guard. So he made a plan. Listen, I'm going to create these folks in my image. And they're going to, I'm going to give them a free will and a choice to follow me or not to follow me. And they're going to, they're going to mess up. So before it even happens, I'm already going to have a plan in place. And here comes the plan. His plan is to bring us back to him in restoration. It's part of his plan. He's trying to give you hope, and he's trying to give you a future. That, my friends, is his plan and his purpose for us. That's his plan. That's his purpose. So what is my purpose? What is your purpose? Very, very easy to define. I've been doing it all night long. First, it's to live this life with hope for the future. Hope in the future of what God has in store for me. If I know that God wants to bless me, if I know that he wants to give good things for me, even if you as earthly fathers would give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father? Hello? So I can hope in that. I can rest in that. I can take comfort in that, and I can find confidence in that. Second, our second purpose is to understand with confidence that I have been called by God for his purpose, called on purpose by him for his purpose. And if I get that uh, assurance in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit, listen, there is nothing that can stop me from furthering his kingdom and accomplishing his purpose for my life. Three, he has chosen you, he has chosen me to accomplish his mission, his purpose, his plan on this earth. Number four, he created me. He created you. He crafted us to accomplish his plan. And that plan, my friends, is the plan of redemption for all mankind. Well, that's not very exciting. Rescuing people out of hell is not exciting enough for you? His son Jesus paid the price for the redemption of mankind. But you and I, listen, Jesus paid the price for the redemption of mankind, but you and I have been commissioned with the task of bringing mankind to the place of redemption. We do it under the power of his Holy Spirit, under the anointing of his Holy Spirit. Don't misunderstand me. It's not about me, but it's about me being obedient under the anointing and the moving and the working of God's Spirit and watching people come to know Christ. The good news is we don't, again, do that on our own. It's not our own strength. We've been given a helper, the Holy Spirit, who comes alongside us and empowers us and equips us to accomplish His plan and His purpose. We are part of the plan. We are part of God's plan, and we're, on, we're part of God's plan on purpose. That, my friend, is our purpose. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you for choosing us. First and foremost, God, thank you for not abandoning us 
when we turned our backs on you, when we spit in your face, when we crucified you and hung you on a cross, Lord, it would have been so uh, justifiable for you to just walk away. But you didn't because you love us. You love us and you had a plan and you have a purpose for us. And so God, I pray tonight uh, that you will reveal to us the plan and purpose that you have for us. Lord, we've talked about some of it tonight here. We know it's to bring honor and glory to you. We know it's to be used in the, in the uh, realm of, of, draw, of uh, bringing mankind to a place of redemption where they come to acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. God, maybe in this room there's, there's something else that you have for us specifically, individually, a purpose in this life. And so, God, I pray that you will begin to reveal that to us. Open our eyes, God, to see what your plan and your purpose is for us and help us walk in that. For your honor, for your glory, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Have a good rest of your week. See you Sunday morning.